So it's always a good sign when there's a kind of buzz of conversation before the event even starts. Um, so good evening. My name's Emma Spruce. I'm a fellow in gender, sexuality and human rights at the gender department here at LSE. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event on storying feminist history, sisterhood and after an oral history of the UK women's liberation movement. Before quickly running through some housekeeping and then introducing our speaker, I wanted to extend my thanks to the team at the library who have organized this event as part of their public uh, program. This is the first of a series of events, of a series of events that commemorate and celebrate 50 years since the Ruskin's Women's Conference and the first Gay Liberation Front meeting, which was held here at LSE. The Gender Department is extremely fortunate to have both the support of fantastic librarians and curators, but also to have access to the Women's Library and the Hall Carpenter Archives, which are both really fantastic resources that I encourage you all to explore if you haven't already. So in terms of housekeeping, I checked with the steward and there's no plans for a fire alarm. Um, so if there is one, follow what they say, which will be to direct us outside. <laughs> he has a very red shirt, we'll know who that is. Um, bathrooms are just directly opposite, um, both accessible uh, and the other ones. Um, and uh, the Twitter tonight, if any of you want to tweet, uh, is hashtag LSE Liberation 50. Um, so as I said, that's to start the, the beginning of this series of events. So tonight we're joined by Professor Margareta Jolly, who's based at the University of Sussex, where she's Professor of Cultural Studies and Director of the Centre for Life History and Life Writing Research. Professor Jolly's talk tonight and the subject of her most recent book emerges from her experience of directing Sisterhood and After the Women's Liberation Oral History Project. Working with the British Library and a team of researchers, Professor Jolly conducted 60 interviews with feminists, academics and intellectuals about their encounters with feminism from the 1960s to the present day. This three-year project is the first national oral history project to, to document the women's liberation movement and the archive that it's produced is truly amazing. So I took the book with me and there are some copies here that I think you'll be able to buy at the end. Um, I took the book with me as pleasure reading over Christmas and it absolutely met that remit. At several points, I found myself giggling at particularly irreverent stories and reading parts to whoever was sitting nearby. The book also, rather embarrassingly, made me realize how shallow my own familiarity with this period of feminist history was. <laughs> and it provided me with plenty of food for thought, particularly about the challenges and the potential that feminist oral history holds. So tonight, Professor Jolly is going to talk for about 40 minutes, and then Debbie Chalice uh, is going to offer a, a brief response. And um, then we'll open the floor up to Q&A for a little while. So if you'd join me in welcoming. And you're going to help me with this. I am. So I'm next slide, to... please, okay. already. Thank you. One, two, three, four. We want a bloody damn sight more. Biology isn't destiny. Equal pay now. Bed or wed, are you free to choose? I'm not just a delectable screwing machine. Capitalism breeds exploitation. Freedom! <laughs> These slogans were chanted at the first Women's Liberation March in the UK in 1971. And the picture you see here was taken of some of the 4,000 women gathering at Hyde Park for the rally. They carried a giant papier-mâché shoe for the old woman with too many children and no childcare. And this mannequin, symbolising martyred womanhood, stockings and shopping bag and brassiered tits. This picture's on the cover of my book, and I chose it because it captures many of the themes I wanted to write about. It is witty, intriguing and romantic, like the women's liberation movement itself. Women's movements reappeared in the UK in the 1960s, 50 years after women had got the right to vote. They realised the silken threads of domestic inequality, sexual inequality and economic inequality, which still bound them. Now that phrase is Sheila Robotham's, one of the many wonderful women who were interviewed for this oral history, and I can see a few here tonight as well, which is quite exciting. It's been interestingly argued, and I think it's true, that the women's liberation movement in the UK was catalyzed by working class women's protests for fair working conditions, just as in the US, 
it was the, the women's liberation movement was catalyzed in particular by the African-American civil rights movement. So movements come from movements is one thing that I really want us to remember today. And one of the most char charismatic speakers at that protest was May Hobbs, a working class leader of a campaign to get women who worked as night cleaners unionized. Um, so she was one of the women we couldn't interview um, because she'd long emigrated to Australia, leaving this cold and horrible country behind for good reason. But again, my point here is that social movements build on each other, but they have complex relationships. They can animate and inspire each other and share tactic, tactics and techniques. But of course, there are strains and misunderstandings between them, which continued through the heyday of women's liberation and still today. As we, I'm sure any, anyone who's in a campaign or a movement will know it's quite complex how to link movements together. But 50 years after the women's liberation movement burst onto the scene, I think it is still influencing our ideals about a better way of organizing gendered society. And that's really also what I want to stress in the book. The campaigns for equal pay, equal opportunity, sexual rights, freedom from violence, for childcare provision are, are still very important and they're still unfinished. Now my history builds on oral history, on the voices of those who were there. And I draw on the oral history archive, which I, next slide please, which I created in partnership with the British Library um, and with others who I'll mention in a moment. This is the landing page uh, where you can read about the project and you can access the interviews and there's lots to discover and really my book is just one interpretation so I'm encouraging you to write your own because this is a much bigger archive than, than I could fully interpret. The idea of doing that archive, of doing a major oral history, not the only one but a, a big one, was initiated by activists um, including Sally Alexander who I'm afraid I have to point out. Um, was really, really key, um, and I think it was sort of really your idea that got the whole thing going. Um, and also with the curator Polly Russell at the British Library, who brought me on board to raise the money from the Levy Hume Trust. Thank you, Levy Hume, for the money, please. So, we did 60 long life interviews, on average six hours long, and all of the interviews, as I say, are archived there, most of them fully open with transcriptions and clips and lots of nice things for you. Now, you may already have this in your, in your, in your sort of sense of oral history, but um, just a word on oral history as a method. It's been a method of choice for radical social movements in the UK as well as the US, South America, South Africa, China, many, you know, in fact, it's, it's globally being taken up by movements or historians of movements because it is so good at capturing the voices of those who are classically not in the archive, those who are not in print, who may not even be literate. And it blends with testimony in a beautiful way. In the UK, I think it's had particularly socialist roots and it, it, it really was associated with the working class history movement of the 50s and 60s. Next slide. Oh, oh, I'll just add one more nice little thing here. Mary Chamberlain, who um, was one of those, in the, was a sort of movement historian, interestingly compared oral history to consciousness raising. Um, and I think that's something we, maybe we can think about in discussion later. So next slide, please. Now, the thing about oral history as well is it gives you multiplicity and it gives you feeling. It is unreliable definitely not this is not the definitive account it is partial but it can be put against the documentary record to give brilliant insights into subjectivity and perspective and Anne Svetkovich's lovely term the archive of feeling these faces represent the 60 women that I and others a small team including Rachel Cohen and Freya Johnson Ross interviewed for the archive chosen on the basis of their involvement in core campaigns or the conceptualization of core ideas. I'm just wondering if we could turn the lights down a little bit, because I'm feeling you, you might not. Yeah, that's better. You can now see all these lovely people. So women from Women's Aid Northern Ireland, Sisters Against Disablement, the Movement for Women's Ordination, Women Against Pit Closures, the National Abortion Campaign, the Organization of Women for Asian and African Descent, 
You'll see internationally reputed intellectuals, activists and artists, including Juliet Mitchell, Lynn Siegel, Susie Orbach, Jenny Murray, and Gail Lewis. I wanted to point out, because she also gave us a, a, a phrase which allows us to think about how you can interpret oral history in general. She said, it allows you to, it, it, it would allow a future historian to learn what subjectivities were available at a particular point in time, at this point in the 1970s and 1980s in the UK. I think that's a really nice way of thinking about it. You'll also notice here a few men. A man. <laughs> in fact, a very, a very special man, because I, anyway, I won't say more. Um, <laughs> but he, he was one of the men who we initially were not going to interview, we thought we've only got money for 60 people and this is this is you know it was still quite a lot of money but even that will only cover 60 in-depth oral histories we just can't we just can't do men you know it's it's another project but then we found a great way around it which was to partner with lucy de lap fantastic historian at the university of cambridge who was coincidentally doing an oral history of um, the anti-sexist men's movement, which she called Unbecoming Men. So that was one way we've, we've sort of, it, was, it seemed very appropriate. It was a linked, but not melded. <laughs> um, although John Petherbridge, who I've just mentioned, um, in fact, was one of the, it was, it was the unexpected one because I was interviewing Zoe Fairburns and she was talking about him having been involved in supporting creches and um, the, the uh, women against violence against women, women's aid. And I said, oh, I'm really interested what, to know that men who did actually stand up for women. She said, well, I'm not going to speak for him. So suddenly he came down and joined in, and so that was how he got interviewed. Now, one quick point here is that we did try to interview trans women. Um, it, was an, it was one of those things that we realized about anachronism, and historically, these movements were so unconnected at the time. It actually proved we couldn't find someone who who would sort of feel that they were under the banner of the history of the women's liberation movement, who was willing to be interviewed. Um, so, as said, these are all available, and also I want to point out there, were, there are 10 short five-minute or so films um, that go with it, which are very useful for teaching and other things, by my fantastic colleague, Lizzie Thin. We also list on the website, which you, I won't show you here, but the many other wonderful oral history projects, such as the Black Cultural Archives, Heart of the Race, Black Women's Movement Collection, Feminist Archive North, Radical Feminist Collection, Scottish and Welsh Movement Interviews, Rape Crisis Interviews, and more recently, the Brighton Transformed Oral History of Trans uh, Life and Liberation in Brighton. So the archive took three years to make and it was opened in 2013, and it's taken me ever since then to write the book about it. So next slide, please. Interpreting these lives admittedly was not easy. All acts of historical remembering bear responsibility. And we live in an age where I think we're becoming increasingly aware of this. The politics of the past, the commodification of the past, for example, through the anniversary, we're in an age of monumentalizing, as Pierre Nora put it, but we're also in an age where monuments are being pulled down. Remembering a social movement bears particular responsibilities. The women's liberation movement is talismanic. Nobody has written the definitive account, and I haven't tried to either, because it is still very recent, and it's quite frightening, I have to say. Um, most of the women are not shrinking violence. They, they're still alive and they have got strong opinions, of course. And I thought I'd just show you these two because I like this as an example of the different versions of events that could be figured through monuments and, and um, forms of memory, acts of remembering. Does anyone, well, it probably says Greenham Common. I don't know if you've ever seen either of these, but Greenham Common, probably one of the best known sort of protest movements of the women's movement in the long sense in the UK. It was a peace, peace protest but led by feminists and lesbian feminists. It began very much as a sort of women and mothers against war and nuclear weapons. And this is what you see, I think, in this kind of statue from the women leaving Cardiff, walking to the Greenham Common Royal Air Force Base to protest in 1981, I think they left. 
But the camp then became much more of a kind of lesbian feminist community and culture. And this is a very different style of commemorative statue, I think, that's more eco-feminist in style. And it, I, I just think it sort of gives that, that flavour of the, the, the two different ways of remembering the same protest. Next slide, please. Another important question about memory is to do with women's, black women's movements and white women's movements and how they related. I think black British feminists of the period often felt a bit frustrated that white feminists would seemingly be very, very interested in African-American protests, but not so aware of the racism going on at home. So that is reflected in, this, as I've suggested, different oral histories that have come out of it and different genealogies. This is a picture of Su Stella Dadzi, Suzanne Scaife and Beverly Bryant, who wrote the very interesting, important um, sort of early history of the black women's movement, Heart of the Race, in 1985. That's them actually writing it, which is a lovely photograph. Um, and this is a picture of another very legendary protest led by um, Asian women against the exploitation at the Grunick, strike photo, uh, Grunick Photograph Factory. Um, and Jaya Bin Desai was the, the, the person that you know, was, was acknowledged as the leader. There she is. So these, these had diff somewhat different genealogies, I think, in their techniques and their kind of political memory coming from independence movements, from former colonies, um, and coming out of anti-racist protests. So next slide, please. So all of this formed the questions that we put together in how we were going to select who to interview, whether we thought about feminist leaders and whether we were trying to interview leaders. How, you know, the question of selection at the point of doing an oral history is already extremely difficult and quite political. But one thing that was clear for me was we were not going to do it by identity. We instead use criteria across campaigns and feminist demands and also by sector, by region, and trying to get a cover of well-known and unknown or lesser known people, and trying to get a spread across ideologies as well as across race, class, sexuality, religion, and age. We committed to doing, uh, interviewing 15 women from Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales. So the final result of who is in the archive is not any, it's not a sample, this is not a social scientific you know, project in that sense, but it's not a bad representation, I think, of what the women's liberation movement was made up of. About a third of the interviewees were or became academics, um, a third became grassroots activists, and a third are public sector or politicians. And crossing over these are cultural activists. We did get a very few business women, not, um, not ordinary business women. Um, one was Ursula Owen from Virago Press, and the other is Barbara Jones, an eco-feminist builder, who I'll talk about later. By far the most were socialist feminists, but there was a sizable minority of radical feminists and a very small number of liberal feminists. And again, these categories overlapped. We, this is a lovely thing about a long life history, as you see people, in fact, move between, including in terms of class. Um, it was not you know, a middle-class movement. It was a cross-class movement, but with people changing their class position as they went along. So, here we come to my own principles as I try to then build on all that to write the narrative. So I'm getting close to the title of the story. How do you story something like this? Um, and I will just pick out here the very inspiring book of um, Claire Hemmings, who of course teaches in this austere, august, august institution of LSE, um, Why Stories Matter. And what Claire gives us is an idea of grammar um, in how you structure a feminist story. And she says, but essentially, there are the, the three grammars that you can use is progress, decline, or return. You can tell the story of the women's liberation movement as it, it was a struggle, it was a, you know, a, a movement of uprising, of, of realization of still, still deep inequalities 
for women. And there was a great lot of struggle, but over time, slowly, we have seen a, a lot of political progress, and here we are today. Look how far we've come. This is, the, this is a kind of narrative you could use, a structure. You could also, however, tell it the other way. This was a movement of utopian vision and of sisterhood and of togetherness and, you know, a great, amazing moment of political solidarity across this vast thing called gender class. And then the movement split and began to argue and Thatcher came along. And look, in fact, it's, you know, that vision has, is, is, is maybe just burning a little bit, but we, ha we have not achieved what we wanted. And moreover, sisterhood is gone. She has this more complex idea of a return structure, which is, well, you know, we got more sophisticated politically and we began to be a little bit more uh, intersectional as a movement and queer and post-queer. Um, and we've gained a few things, but we actually need to go back to the, those visions and t return and take perhaps particularly in Claire's argument, the socialist visions, or at least the materialist, the economic, that we might have lost as we've, we've gone forward. So I found this kind of interesting challenge. Which of these do I want to do? <laughs> and I thought, well, actually, I don't, I don't want to tell something that's ideologically driven at all. I want to just start from the experience. I want to tell a social history. I want to talk about the characters, the people. I want to make use of that lovely quality of oral history to be very Im embedded in everyday life. So you'll s I'll say more about how it came out. But at this point, I'm just going to give you an example. Right, so, oh. Now, that's, there. Yeah, mm. Okay. I'm not going to give you an example. I'm going to just here show you the wonderful place where the, uh, the oral history is archived, the British Library, and the, the challenge of... This does follow from my point. I wanted to allow people to be individuals, but not to, go, to be individualistic. So, okay, next one. Let's see. Right, so now here's my example. Joe Robinson, who, um, yes... Um, I think is going to come into the news again quite soon. If any of you have heard the new Miss, uh, film about Miss World protest that's, that's coming out soon, I haven't seen it, but um, I think Jo is in it because she was one of those, as you can see from here, um, who went to that very legendary protest against the Miss World beauty pageant in 1970 at the Albert Hall. Um, and this is her throwing anywhere. I'll tell you in a minute. Um, but the, the, the point about how, how to write about someone like Jo Robinson and how to put her into a bigger, bigger story. I think she was quite representative in a way of the main baby boomer generation of activists. She was born in 1942 in Birmingham. Her father was a butcher. Her mother was a so-called housewife, not very happy one. Um, and despite that unhappy childhood, she broke away from her parental expectations. Um, you know, they, they were aspirational for her. They wanted her to leave the butcher, butching, butcher house, you know. Um, but they weren't too happy about what she did initially because she went to art school. But again, I think that's not untypical of this generation of activists. She, and she also, like many of them, made her way to London. She originally thought, I'll be a film director. But instead, she got involved in activism. She became a member of a radical printmaking collective. And she joined all sorts of campaigns and movements, including international socialists and supported British black power, the Ford Women's Strike for Equal Pay. She lived in a, a well-known, if not notorious, commune where the childcare was not only just shared, all the children were given the same la last name, which was wild. Isn't that wild, I think? Okay, so we go back to her um, at the, the Miss World Beauty pageant. Of course, this festival of women's objectification, beamed across the nation by the BBC, required family viewing, you know. Uh, this, is, this is really, you know. And um, I can't help but repeat this. Bob Hope, who was the compare, actually said as the women came on stage, here come the cattle. Um, so the wonderful slogan that's 
you will see actually in the exhibition that's on here the that women's liberation movement activists including joe came up with was we're not beautiful we're not ugly we are angry so the plan was to go there at the agreed signal football rattle going off stand up throw leaflets and vegetables and flower bombs and you know it's really still very inspiring um so i analyzed this protest and her involvement as something inspiring but i do suggest you know there are pros and cons to this kind of activism as there are to consciousness raising as in spectacle militancy all very important but also you need reform-based elements or at least there were reform-based elements of that movement and i look at that sort of reprise of the suffragette suffragist split which was was there in the in the sort of 1910s 20s um, protest as well i also look at the way that activists like robinson began to develop feminist professions so very you know, anti-establishment but she did go on and train as a radical midwife and i look at the idea of biographical availability for activism what money, what networks were needed to enable it, to catalyze it. And I ended up concluding, just as Olive Banks did in her study of first wave, so-called first wave feminism, that feminism is not so much a reaction to a personal situation of despair or frustration, but a response to an intellectual tradition of social and political reform. So, you know, it's actually more than, it's not just going, I feel oppressed, I'm going to do something. You need resources to move to that stage. And actually, it's often exciting, and you're happy doing it. You're not feeling miserable. I also look at so-called biographical consequences of activism. So Robinson went on to be, um, as I said, a midwife, but she, at least last I knew, has become a gardener. A late life job, I think, characteristic of a feminist of this generation. And in some ways, in the interview, she expresses some sadness about her choices, earlier choices, the instability and the effect on her child. And I do look, in a general sense, at the personal sacrifice that activists made. Lower incomes, divorces, not having had kids, mental health struggles. But we, don't, we must not overdo this because studies of the women's liberation movement veterans are actually like an exaggerated version of their generations. Actually, this is true of the gener the, that generation as a whole. There was a, a, a shift towards liberalism, towards youth culture, towards non-traditional anti-materialist lifestyles, towards also um, what people call the, the post-modernization of aging. So some of the sadness is actually the result of having had more choice in life is actually a marker of the movement's success. And I looked here at, yes. Ooh. Sorry, you mean the post-modernization of uh, oh, oh, right. Well, being able to, so if you're 50, you, well, you know, it's like me, <laughs> I'm in my 50s. 50s is the new 70s or 70s is the new 50 or, you know, it's, so you're moving from the life cycle idea to the life course and you can make, make the age you want to be with. Anyway. It's one of the many, ways in which we have more choice but choice can always be a bit difficult so I look at Sara Ahmed's powerful influential ideas on uh, living a feminist life and I, I'm sure some of you've heard her idea that feminists are often said to be killjoys a bit mean and miserable and she goes yeah good the reason we're miserable is because how can you go around being happy when once you've had your political awareness raised and you know that you know every all the pleasure that you have is on the back of someone else's oppression you know we, it's part of being a, a politically conscious to to not be superficially happy it's about so anyway she she does she gives that quite austere challenge to us but i quite like the fact that in these oral histories i found that actually many of these activists really enjoyed life as well you know they, they there was that sense of the seriousness but there was also a lot of frivolity and and sort of humor even about their own earlier selves so i'm now going to give you this wonderful example from joe robinson so if right i'm going to come over here and see if i do it properly <coughs> go off to the 
Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, this is an example of one of the clips you can listen to on the website. And there's the transcript, but I'm going to play it, and I hope you will hear what I'm talking about. Oh. I oh, wait. I should give you the context. So, she was remembering um, an early protest against um, Nixon, President Nixon, in London. Um, right. And she was... <laughs> It connected up to being asked about sexual pleasure. I didn't expect pleasure with men. I just expected pleasure for myself. And I didn't masturbate until I was like 26. And the reason is, it's really weird, but I went on this demonstration and Nixon was coming to Claridge's Hotel. And we waited hours and hours in the rain and eventually these motorbikes came whizzing past and Nixon was in the car and he was in the hotel and we never saw him and it was all over. And I went home and I was so furious, I was so angry that I masturbated with real anger and had a fantastic orgasm for the first time in my life. <laughs> and you had an orgasm before? No. But you've been sexually active for a while? Yes. And why hadn't you masturbated before? Well, I had, but I hadn't gone through with it. I didn't know. <laughs> you get the idea. So we have the, we have the PowerPoint. So, I mean, I just love this, because it, it is about the, the strange mixture of anger and a consciousness raising and joy and pleasure and sexuality. So, okay, so... Another discussion I have in the book is about the relationship of feminism to family life. So the family is, next slide please, um, a core political site for any understanding of gender relations. Feminists have revealed of course how it's a place of work, of unpaid work, unrecognised labour, of hidden sexual power and contract, a place where ideas of gender are formed. Um, and there were many brilliant intellectual thoughts about the family at this time. At the same time, there were serious disagreements. Should it be reformed, diversified, abolished, reinvented? Now here you see Mukami McCrum, um, who was again one of the interviewees, and she was a teacher who was prominent in the Scottish uh, women's movement and particularly Shakti Women's Aid Shelter for Women of Colour. And she talked about how crucial it was that she supported her family back in Kenya. And her struggles with what she thought were disrespectful and short-sighted strategies by white feminists about the duties involved in family. She was expressing long-standing disagreements with white feminists here, particularly that of Mary McIntosh, who you also see here. And McIntosh, uh, Mary McIntosh led the so-called Why Be a Wife campaign for women's financial and legal independence, which helped get childcare benefits paid to mothers, not fathers. And she wore the Don't Do It die badge um, when Diana Spencer was put forward as suitable wife material for Prince Charles. If you're watching The Crown, you might feel she was right. Um, and the other thing is, of course, Mary McIntosh's archives are here in, at the LSE. So Mary McIntosh wrote The Antisocial Family with Michelle Barron in 1980, or, or co-wrote it. And it, it was a very clever book talking about the isolating and privatising effect of family life under patriarchal capitalism. But it was in tension with the messages that black feminists like Mukami McCrum and others who were saying, well, family life for minority ethnic or migrant peoples were crucial sources of resistance and pride, and they were hardly privatised within state or slave economies. So really difficult. Both are right, of course. These are both really important points. But what I thought was interesting was that the oral history softened these positions. So in her long oral history, Makami McCrum talked very honestly about the violence and gender stereotyping in her family. And she also talked about moving beyond anger. And I like this picture of her with her granddaughter. And Mary McIntosh, also talked about, well, the thing is, it's true that lesbians made families in their own way. 
In fact, she said, we invented serial monogamy. Um, and it, she did this in part with Michelle Barrett, who uh, at the time was she was partners with. And what I did love, um, and sadly she is, no, she's died since this, but it, so I couldn't ask her, but, but this was the doll's house on Mary McIntosh's desk next to us when we were doing the interview. And I did say, well, what, what is that? And she said, that's my doll's house. And I just thought, this is this fantastic um, detail of everyday life that makes it more complex. It's not schematic ideological positions. Um, so I muse about feminist family making in the book. And I, I'm, I'm worrying about time, so we better go to the next slide. I also mused about surviving Thatcherism and how we could humanize the set narratives of the 1980s. So Margaret Thatcher, of course, a horrible anniversary last year, 40 years since she was elected, Britain's first woman prime minister, bitterly ironic for feminists, of course, because you couldn't have got a less feminist prime minister. Well, actually, maybe we could, thinking about it. Oh, my God. Reincarnation. Anyway, um, so the 1980s often get written about in histories of the movement as radical feminism versus socialist feminism, the sex wars, you know, important, difficult political debates. But I thought, no, I, what I want to do is to talk about what interviewees were actually doing at the time in their everyday lives. House purchasing or renting or shopping, feminist fashion, cooking, you know, um, which I just, yes, fit from spare rib, um, which actually showed a lot of commonalities across these groups. Um, and Barbara Jones, I mentioned, one of the very few sort of overtly feminist businesswomen, um, had a fantastic story of learning, uh, building skills through women in manual trades, coming out, creating lesbian community in Todmorden, which is the UK's equivalent of the women's land movement in the US, I think. Um, and how her eco-housing building business can be thought of as a form of feminist entrepreneurship. So this raises, it's like a kind of reverse mirror of the, the kind of Thatcherist entrepreneur, woman's entrepreneur. Um, and it raises questions about the role of money and business in building autonomy and community. Um, she actually says money is evil. Um, so um, it's not a straightforward thing. Next slide, please. Oral histories also pointed me to more complex stories of relationships with men than is sometimes assumed. So I've already mentioned that, I think, but touched on that. But it was really interesting that many well-known women discovered feminism through men. Barbara Taylor, Sheila Robotham and Gail Lewis all first heard the term feminist from a male friend, lover or teacher. Um, here's a picture of the well-known um, academic intellectual Stuart Hall, leading theorist of race relations and popular culture at the time, helping out in the crash at Ruskin, the first women's liberation movement con conference. And I, so I tried to put these oral histories into dialogue. Um, and to be a bit empathetic, really, to, to the men who were also struggling to get this right, um, you know, just one little example of um, some men set up a thing called Cash Against Sexism. That sounds good, but they didn't know who to give it to because there's there isn't who is the women's movement. There's, there's all these different networks who are all different. There, there was no headquarters anyway. Um, <laughs> but thinking about men, of course, raised another complex question related to oral history, which was about traumatic memory because actually a, a, quite a lot of women had traumatic memories of sexual violence or domestic violence or harassment. So that's a question, how to not re-trigger, um, but also how not to stylize and to, to get people to tell stories that are sort of politically useful. Um, so there's a lot of questions around trauma. And actually, next slide, please. There's a question around traumatic memory by women of other women. Yes, sadly, sadly that is true. That actually some of the most painful memories are to do with sense of struggle within the movement and, and how, how sometimes feeling of great disappointment from seemingly so-called sisters. Barbara Taylor, I've mentioned, one of a, a brilliant um, feminist historian, talks about 
the very dark emotion which flowed through the women's movement. And she said this is really coming from matriarchy within patriarchy, mother-hating and sister-hating, which is imported into a feminist movement. Well, that's one theory. There are lots of other theories about why women can be horrible to each other, um, which are some, some of, you know, again, something you can find from theorists that we interviewed, including Susie Orbach. Um, but I do think what you definitely get is the, the challenge when women have high expectations of each other, political expectations, and actually some of the most painful arguments are between people who are really, they share so much, you've got so much in common. So now I'm coming back to how you can tell the story. We could tell a story of sort of tragedy, of being, you know, betrayal. We could tell it as satire. People have often done that with feminists, easy to make fun of. We could make it farcical, or we could make it romantic. Um, but I wanted to have a little bit of all of this, but basically a hopeful story. So next slide. I wanted to have the river is flowing, growing and flowing. The river is flowing down to the sea. I wanted to have something of that quality. Now that is a fragment of song sung by Ch Gail Chester, who was one of the many who were remembered being in a political choir or singing. And the point of this, this is Rebecca Johnson, another interviewee, was at Greenham, and she, she sang all the way through, and her interview was 21 hours. So <laughs> the point about oral history, though, is you do get sound, you get singing, you get the joy. And this is, it, it's almost the joy of, of, of being in a movement. Sometimes it isn't about the arguments or the verbal, it's about the nonverbal. And so... I conclude my book, um, next slide please, by thinking about sound as a historical tool and also as a resource for future mo uh, movements. And I think about the non-verbal as well as the verbal. Sighs, tears, disruptions, interruptions, as well as singing and, and song. And I hear, was inspired by Ken Cormier after Roland Barthes, who talks about the punctum of the recorded life, so this is a little theoretical, but the punctum rather than the studium. The punctum is the unconscious moment when you're touched as a listener. So just a few other examples apart from the song is Sheila Kissinger, nat natural birth campaigner, who demonstrated the way a sheep pants when it's giving birth, and you can hear her going <laughs> like this. And you can hear Una Kroll demonstrating to me her sermon voice as she explains you know, what it was like finally as a woman to be up there in the pulpit um, and it just very different voice she put on. Or Mikami Makram with a sudden thunder outside the window when she was remembering her childhood in Kenya. Or the voice of Mary McIntosh, who, as I said, has since died. And so there's a haunting, as a late life voice that now is a haunting. So how should we use the power of sound? Of course, we can do it directly um, on the... British Library website, we have over 120 clips for you, so you can have the quick, quick way in. We have films, as I said. But I want to end the talk um, by taking us back to the question of storying, how to frame that sound. And my, my solution, this is just my own one, was to try to integrate collective biography into a wider social and domestic history to try to let people be people and not just be activists and not just be representative of a, of a certain ideological position. Um, so that was my way. Um, actually, the opposite of Claire Hemming's way, which was to take all the people out and to make it just a very beautiful, um, abstract history of intellectual thought. But what I tried to do, like Claire Hemmings, is to have neither progress nor decline, but a, a history of multiple movements, sometimes in, coming together, not always, in a kind of spiral. So, next slide. I, I'm getting to the end. <laughs> we must confess it is hard to do this, to, to try and be subtle in this way, for a general audience. So I've been very curious to see how LSE has done it in its new exhibition, which I hasten to say is just open and is here. You know, if you go into the library, it's there for you. And I, would, I, I really enjoyed seeing it today.
Um, I think it's, it's getting some of that subtlety by putting together the anniversary of the women's liberation movement with the anniversary of the gay liberation front. So, again, two movements, and they talked to each other, but they didn't always agree. Next slide. We also have the forthcoming exhibition at the British Library, Unfinished Business, which I also encourage you to go and see. And um, this is focusing, this has got a really big narrative challenge because this is 200 years of women's rights struggle across the UK. And it's, you know, so that, ha what is the framework? Polly Russell, um, who's the lead curator and the brain behind it, um, worked with an advisory board, which includes Debbie Chalice and myself, um, and came up with this structure of, next slide, body, mind, and voice. So trying to give a focus through three key um, domains of struggle. But I think you get a clue to the overall narrative form from the title, which is Unfinished Business. So what you have is a progress narrative, which is incomplete. Next slide. And this, this slide from the book of the exhibition, which I've co-edited with Polly, gives a further clue to the structure, which is, it's a rhetorical structure of invitation and exhortation. So this is Harriet Martineau, 19th century feminist, and she says, the progress of emancipation of any class takes place through the efforts of individuals of that class. All women should inform themselves of the condition of their sex and of their own position. So that's quite a should there, but, but of course she's right. In other words, if you want to know the end of the story, if you want to finish the business, you're going to have to help write it. Next slide. Well, one person who has literally done this, literally, is LSE's Debbie Chalice. So I mentioned Debbie, is, who was on the advisory board, um, she also wrote the chapter Autonomy in and Through the Body for the exhibition book and advised on that section of the exhibition. So before we open up to discussion, I want to hand over, so it was very appropriate that she finish us with some thoughts. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Oh, that, that's a hard act to follow, isn't it? <laughs> so um, I thought what I'd do is write a little bit about, talk a little bit about writing this chapter um, and the difficulty of, you know, writing about these issues in the third person. Um, so we've heard about oral history and there was a bit of debate when we were writing, when we were putting the book together as to what you know, person we should write in, I, we, they, and it was decided the third person, which of course is what, as, as a, somebody who writes learning resources and has written exhibition texts and academic articles before, I'm well used to. Having said that, it's really difficult to write about personal issues and rights um, that I cover in this book. In a massive, there's so much, you, you could have written four times more than that, you know, than is in the chapter. Um, and there is a kind of absence, um, and I think there's an absence of the personal, which hopefully when you go to the exhibition you'll hear some of the oral histories that put that personal back in. So I thought what I'd slightly reference today is a kind of the, the memoir and I, how I think, certainly for my generation, and I think those younger than me, um, are kind of, there's a resurgence of memoir, particularly around these issues. Um, and of course you can talk about me too, but around the issues of, you know, autonomy over the body. Um, and actually, I'm going to quote Sheila Robotham, and she's wrote, she, in her memoir on the 60s, Promise of a Dream, she says, to write memoir, you have to unlearn some habits. Uh, I almost found the reverse with this, that I, because I'm writing a memoir of my own, that I actually had to really force myself to write in the third person. I found it quite hard. Um, and I think it's partly because I've been slightly immersed in reading a lot of memoirs over the last two or three years, because I think some of the themes, particularly around feminism and race and class in Britain today, some of the best responses have been through personal essays and memoir writing. So thinking about Renee Edo Lodge, why I'm no longer talking to white people about race or Akala natives, race and class and the ruins of empire, are both books that the writers use their personal experience of race and racism in Britain to reflect on where we should be moving forward and how we should be addressing history. Um, and thinking about feminism um, and, and how we think you know, about our bodies, in particular, Catherine Angel on Desiring Unmastered or Emily Pine on Women's Fluids In and Fluid Bodies, 
in notes to self, um, notes on bleeding and other crimes, um, I think is really important, particularly when you're thinking about the body. But of course, um, Alison Lights, who's publishing a memoir of her life with Raphael Samuel, who was involved um, in the women's movement in the 70s, um, it says that memoirs seem closer to memories, plural, unreliable, and random. But that's what I think is good about them. And I like the oral histories, but of course they're a literary form. So it's very difficult to return to one of the themes of the chapter. How do you capture pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum depression, or things that can come with ch having children, if you're fortunate enough to be able to have them and want them? Um, how do you capture that through a third-person narrative? I think it's really hard. And I'm not sure I've done it, but there are people who have. And um, Sarah Knott, in her book, um, Mother and Unconventional History, um, consciously draws on Anna Oakley um, and her sort of work around women in the 70s and, um, and Sheila Kissinger as well, and sort of childbirth activists, um, to kind of push that history of women and pregnancy back further, right into the 17th century. Which, and it's an amazing book. I, I really urge you to read it. Or Francesca Siegel, who has written about um, prematurity and having very sick babies in The Mothership. And Jen Ashworth, who, which I haven't read, it's arriving today, um, Notes Made While Falling, which is um, basically talks about traumatic childbirth and the aftermath of that and looking at crisis. So just to take one line, um, I reference IVF and how that changes reproduction and um, sexual reproductive technologies, if you like. And, and when I was writing that line, I thought of the, there was an exhibition at the Science Museum in London um, in 2018 to mark the 40th anniversary of um, the birth of Louise Brown, the first baby, the first live baby, I should say, born through IVF. And it, there, there is a section, much like in the British Library, there will be a section of oral histories that did tell these stories of couples who'd gone through treatment with varying results, you know, actually having children, not having children, adopting or making the peace with you know, not being able to have children. Um, but at the same time in the exhibition, there was a kind of month, there was this laid out um, a month of all the, all the drugs that you take when you do IVF. As somebody who's been through it and, and knows what it's like, I, you know, this was a glossy, pretty table, but I couldn't help but look at it and think there's no reference there to the person taking those drugs. The person is having to inject between all the bruises or put the pessaries up themselves and take the drugs that alter your body. Um, and it was completely absent. And yet, there are memoirs that talk about it. So uh, Julia um, Lee, talk, um, in Avalanche, a love story, captures the physical and emotional toll of, of the endless hope offered by this miracle. And the grief of infertility is talked about in Lorna Gibbs's Childless Voices, Stories of Longings, Loss and Resistance. And she also captures what infertility means um, f f for women throughout the world and sort of does this kind of memoir stroke extended essay. So I guess just to finish, um, that exhibitions, catalogues, academic books are all important ways of marking and understanding women's history and our transition for it as well as campaign for rights but it's only one form. So it's important to have the voices, the oral histories and the memoirs, whether they're online or print, to vividly tell different stories. And I think that the, the sort of resurgence of life writing and the determination to tell our story, whoever we are um, as women, has a continuity with the women's liberation movement. And it is in that line, a dotted line, if you like. But, you know, if without the women that Margaret has been talking about, we wouldn't wouldn't be doing that in the same way. Thank you. Thank you both. So we do have a bit of time for questions, um, which I'll try and gather. Does anybody have want to start us off? Yeah. Um, I'll write it over to you. One word that I think you used three times and used to my hearing was sort of almost visceral hostility, and the word was Thatcher. Um, and the truth of the matter was that Margaret Thatcher only came to power because millions of people, our fellow citizens, perhaps even some people here, or people they know, voted Conservative. And I'd just like to know what your attitude is to those people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Mm. 
<laughs> it's a really hard question. I mean, so I suppose you're saying, you know, in, in the little context, of, you know, because I could say the same of at the moment, how, how have we got into this situation where so many people have voted in the, you know, the UK's orange monster friend, you know, whatever. So, uh, you know, I wish I, I had the political, <laughs> really, I'm, I'm, I'm not enough, I, I don't think I can really answer it. But in terms of how, I, I think you're right to say that if you tell the story of, e.g., the women's liberation movement, you have to ultimately relate it to the wider political context and all the other people who didn't necessarily see themselves as feminists but maybe slightly sympathised or who completely reacted against it. So I think that's, that's a really good point. Um, I, didn't, I didn't fully do that. You know, I think that would be... You know, I'm trying to think who... Without saying Dominic Sandbrook, because he's a bit right-wing, but um, he, you know, he, he is somebody who tries to put, give a, a wider social history and put the movements in that. But I, I think I did do that somewhat, a little bit with the national abortion campaign, where I looked at the, at the same time, the rise of, what was it called, SPUC, the Society for Protection of Unborn Children. So this is back on the politics of choice, choice over your reproduction. Um, and yes, and they saw themselves as a, a great anti-establishment social movement. So y it's quite true. Many things one thinks that I think you can think are just about left wing or feminist movements are actually exactly the same for right wing anti-feminist movements in terms of the solidarity, maybe even the first person testimony, the techniques, you know, and annoyingly, actually, I think the right wing has often copied the left wing of some of its best ways of getting that solidarity. So I do, I do touch on that and, and look at how those two groups were sort of positioning themselves against each other and wonder why women would have signed up for the Society of Protection of Unborn Children. Well, I mean, it's not that hard to see. It's because obviously they're thinking, well, that's going to give protect my certain rights and status as a mother, which I've had throughout history. Even if I haven't had many other rights, at least I've had those rights. And I think, you know, there was an element of that with, with Thatcher, the sort of small c. I, I don't want massive change. I don't understand, you know. I, that, but, you know, <laughs> I think you probably know better than I do on that one. Thank you um, for the presentation. I would like to ask you about how women deal with the complexities and maybe the contradictions in their stories. It feels to me that sometimes when women tell stories, there is already a, a, a story prepared to be told. Um, so it has been thought before it's told. And um, um, I was just wondering what happens when women find themselves talking about issues that contradict each other such as, you know, being an activist or being a feminist and then how they reconcile that with uh, the views about domesticity. And um, uh, is something that they do through the story or is something that the story helps them to bring together? Yeah, hmm. yeah these are good questions around method. Um, I think it is a, a quite common thing that if you're doing oral history you will get people telling you their set stories particularly in late life I think it's very normal to have favorite stories you 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 know that become part of your identity and you want to share it with someone especially a nice shiny young well I'm not young but anyway anymore but you know <laughs> Uh, I think I think there's a, an often an, a very fascinating kind of psychology in, in the interview that, that can play into that that way of the stories that get told. So I think rather than just say that's not good, one of the one of the techniques is to to allow and respect why a set story has been told and uh, think about the psychology, but also maybe think about the political context. This, was, uh, this is classically what Alessandro Portelli did in looking at the set narratives of a whole town who all misremembered the date when somebody was killed. 
everybody was saying, making the same mistake. And he was going, hang on, that's, this is a reason. And then, of course, it, it's because there's a collective wish not to remember when what the real trauma was about because it was too shameful. So, you know, you can do things with misremembering, with patterns, by comparing it to what's in the documentary archive or comparing different versions from different people or comparing the same person, like you've said, who may be saying different things at different times. I, I think the challenge is to try and do it ethically and respectfully and to, to realize we're as well, we all do this. It's not, you know, it's part, part of making memory. Um, so I, I tried to enjoy some of the little inconsistencies. As I said, to me, that was about letting activists be people. Hi, thank you for your um, talk and for the work on the archive. I've been sort of dipping into it and it's really um, beautiful and kind of compelling. Um, so I work on sort of histories of feminist theatre and mental health activism. And one of the things that I'm quite interested in is instances in which like s group um, activist work and performance have been a case where the kind of the doing of it is itself seen as the activism and it is constitutive of a new community. Um, and so I had a question about whether that's something that's come up in your work and, and how you put that kind of work together with sort of more um, obviously kind of political activism that's lobbying for certain kinds of change. And then my other question is whether you see the creation of this archive as a kind of further iteration of that work of that you're reconfiguring these voices into a new kind of community that can speak to further generations. Oh, that's a really beautiful idea of yours. <laughs> um, um, yes, I, it's, so, it's something very philosophical and poetic about the idea of process and the prefigurative and the living it. And it, it's, it's very inspiring. And I'm, I didn't hugely talk about that, though. Um, I, I, what you've brought to mind was Sue O'Sullivan, one of the, I think, very wise people in the movement, who did say very clearly, I just wasn't a campaign person. It wasn't to me about joining campaigns. I was someone who was interested in grassroots and in, in the, the living of it and in the trying to, trying to change behavior from the ground up, really. And given she's so wise and she managed to seemingly get on with everybody, well, at least as far as I know, she, which is quite diff impressive, um, you know that that I, I quoted her at length because I thought she did represent a lot of women who f that was their approach to what the movement meant. It was about being, becoming, not about formal politics at all. It was about trying to change what poli doing politics meant. However, I also really was interested in the many others who were no you've got to you've got to be quite um, professional about it or you've or if you don't like that word which is a bit bit challenging or a bit um, contested um, you still need to be very practical so Jean the Hammer was another one who I felt uh, she was very interesting about consciousness raising because she was like you know <laughs> it's it's got its place but once you've you know, I've kind of been there, done that. I'm just really interested in what works, and I know what works. And as we know, she went on and, and became very um, important in getting the police and social services to take on feminist ideas. And she was just much more hard-headed, I think, than, not than Sue O'Sullivan, but that idea of, you know, maybe more artistic way of thinking of it. So... It's, I tried to look at the spread and say exactly like, like I mentioned, the suffragettes and the suffra suffragists are the suffragettes, but those who were more reform orientated, those who were more revolutionary, and sort of acknowledge there was a spread. But, well, you Sally. Both. They were often both, which is also what you said. I mean, that the suffragettes, people who were suffragists, were you know, often both militant and constitutionalist. You do everything. Right. And Sally, who definitely was there and knows more than I do, um, you know, you probably did did a bit of all of that. Yeah, 
very much about, which was build. Yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> which was, um, you know, at the time. It's so long ago, folks. Sorry. It's <laughs> so long ago, and I was young. But you were trying to build from, as Sue O'Sullivan said, you were trying to remake your life as you lived it then. You So your children, your lover, your women's center, your setting up the women's refuge, your thinking what a good idea it would be to get equal pay, or you were doing it from then. Can I say, can I make yes, a... Yes, I'd love you to. Yeah. Can I make a point about yeah, oral absolutely. history? Because um, I think it was somebody that you, you, you asked about oral history, but there might be other younger people here who've never done oral histories, and I've done oral history, and everybody you want to interview always says, oh, I've got nothing to say, you won't find me interesting, and so on. Never mind set stories that they have. They all think they've got nothing to say. And whenever I'm asked to be interviewed, I always say, I've got nothing to say. You know, I've said it all before, and I've said it all, you know. So people don't always know that they've got set stories. And when you talk to them, in fact, the conversation, and this is what you mean, I know, Margareta, because I've read your book and I know your work is brilliant, that you, the conversation starts, breaks up the set stories, doesn't it? It's, so you think you've got nothing to say or you think you've got a set story. And of course, I think I'm never going to say anything about my personal relationships, unlike the wonderful Joe. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about, you know, Joe is outrageous. <laughs> And, of course, you find yourself telling the interviewer about, you know, the underside of your marriage. <laughs> it's extraordinary. So the conversation itself undermines stories, doesn't it? And as you say, subject... Actually, I think that, that's... Yeah, I was... I only said one side of the answer to that. That's absolutely true. And I do, I do think one point was because we had the sort of luxury of long oral histories, which could go on for hours as opposed to the semi-structured interview of a social science project. I think that's where you really can get, you go beyond. You start with, oh, well, you know, it was... Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Everyone says, you're quite right. Oh, I don't have anything to say. Yeah. Yeah. You could talk. For, I mean, one could, go, yeah, absolutely. It, it's very intimate and very intense, isn't it? Very intense. <laughs> I think there was another question. Yeah, so we'll take this question um, and that will close us off, I think, for you. Thank you for a fascinating talk and a, and a wonderful project. I was struck by one thing you said about how the oral histories um, reveal the, the frivolity and the humour of, the, of these um, women and men. Um, and I, I wondered if you'd like to say a bit more about that. I can see on one level it's making, you know, it's part of allowing them to be people. But I wonder if you think that there's any, any more importance than that to, to having that as part of the record of this movement. That's a lovely question as well. Um, yeah, I think, I think it is challenging, the killjoy, actually. Because, you know, I, I found myself really sort of thinking about Sarah Ahmed saying... You know, I've thought so much about that, about the, the kind of burden that comes with the, the more aware you become. I, I feel it anyway. Every day, I'm, oh, God, I can't bear it. What now on the news? And, you know, how to preserve a sense of resilience, really. So I don't think everybody manages it. I think, actually, you can really pay a price, and some people get really down, and I can't completely respect that. But I do think, you know, like Joe jo Robinson, I mean, her, she uh, does have great downs, terrible downs. But then there's something sort of mad and funny and wonderful. And uh, so it, it's partly something you can hear with people laughing, slightly rueful, or just just making jokes. You know, Gail Chester is actually quite good at making very witty jokes. I and mean, she has this remembering... She was remembering being made, uh, trying to, being a teenager. And so we were on sex education, you know, the terrible sex education that women had at that time, which I don't know how much better it is. 
but she was like oh god and then I had to try and learn to dance and it was like rock and roll and oh my god I was in front of the mirror I've got my friend we're trying to do the twist you know and it was just you know she said and then you know my mum was not only Jewish but Irish she was blooming Irish it was just she just didn't get it you know and so she will really say these things it was very quite quite winning and um so it's trying to challenge stereotypes of what feminism is feminisms it's many things there are many kinds of feminists and i think that's what i was trying to do was sort of just a little bit of painting that portrait but but i do want to we can't end you know end without saying quite a few people are here who who do know you know the first person jane or, or zoe or sally or others here who really will know better than me about what it was to live through all that and um yeah and i'm, I'm thanking you so much and, and thank yeah, you for and having so me that closes off to say thank you to both of the speakers again there are some books um if that's whetted your appetite and they are it's a fantastic read uh, so thank you for, for talking to us about it On, on the books, um, knock down, and I'm going to give the money to Mama Cash because I really love this. This is a great feminist um, organisation. So it's a £10 a book for Mama Cash and also um, a complimentary um, free DVD of the Sisterhood films from Lizzie Thin, who has given me some to give away. So you can just come and have them. <laughs>